Hi, today I'm going to talk about shape memory alloys, specifically material models for nitinol type materials that exhibit super elasticity. This kind of material is very commonly used in, in the biomedical industry for various implant applications. And they are a class of material models that are very widely used here. And that's, they're typically based on the original work that's shown on the paper here. And uh, this paper has been implemented in most finite element softwares these days, Abacus, ANSYS, COMSOL, etc. And what I want to talk about here today is just a little bit about this type of material model, how easy it is to work with it using M calibration specifically. So I'm not going to go through the theory of the model in great detail. It's all written in this paper and following papers by various authors. And it's pretty simple, the theory itself, so it's not all that super interesting. This specific paper has a pretty substantial number of citations, as one would expect for something this fundamental. It's about 700 of this original paper uh, citations at this point. What I wanted to do is just open up M calibration and illustrate how you can work with this type of material model. So there's a blank window of M calibration. I'm going to select the material model here, and there are two choices that may be of interest for my demonstration today. The first one is the Abacus Super Elastic Material Model, and in M calibration, this is the version that's available, and you can see the keywords down here. So I'm just going to select this as listed here. M calibration would warn us that you typically should specify the experimental data first and then the material model, so it, the software can assign default guesses based on the experimental data. For my demonstration, that doesn't matter so much. Here, what I want to do now is to create a load case of something that could be kind of interesting, uh, hopefully. So I'm going to just create a new experimental load case here. I'm going to do it as a virtual experiment. I'm going to load it up with any strain rate because this material model is not strain rate dependent. I'm going to load it to 8% strain in about uh, 500 data points and then I'm going to unload it with the same strain rate. I'm going to just go to a, a negative strain of 8%. So I'm going to go tension and I'm going to go in compression and then we get both a little bit of loading and unloading at the same time. So I'm going to do 500 data points in this one as well. If I save this one here, I can then run this example as, as is listed here. So here is how it looks like. This starts from 0, 0, and it goes up, and then right, and then down, and left, and then it goes back to 0. And this is why this is called super elasticity, because there's no permanent deformation in this particular model. And then in compression, it goes like this. You can make this more interesting by making this transition strain here, the EPS L, a little bit smaller. This is how, how wide this plateau region is. So just to remind you, if you haven't seen this before, the initial response is uh, austenitic, and then it's a phase transformation that occurs that gives you a different slope here. And that's what's going on in this material. So if I make this a little bit narrower, I can make it, um, and then we see that we get continuing deformation here after we have full transition of the microstructure. And we see that the initial slope here is actually a little bit different here. And that's given by these two numbers. If I make this a little bit smaller, you can perhaps distinguish the slopes a little bit more. This is now a 30 gigapascals, and this is 60 gigapascals. You can, of course, set these to your actual materials that you're interested in. And then in compression, you have a specific parameter that controls the onset of yielding compression. If I make this a little bit larger, say 500, we'll get reverse plasticity as well. But you see that the model itself, you can specify different yield stress and tension and compression, and it is very easy to calibrate to experimental data by, by just running the calibration uh, the way I've been demonstrating it here. Um, I'm going to just do a second example using the, the COMSOL version of this shape memory alloy. Here is the COM, I mean, sorry, the ANSYS representation is given here. And I'm just going to run this one time. And here is the, the, the response that we get here. I'm going to make this a little bit transition region a little bit shorter as well. In this case, we can see that we're continuing 
um, a super elastic response after we have 100% transition. These parameters is the onset of the transition. That's this point here. This point is the full, uh, full transformation. And then the reverse transformation. And finally, the full uh, reverse uh, recovery point is over here. In the ANSYS, there is a, also the ability to distinguish between tension and compression. And I can just make this a little bit, maybe we make it a little larger. And then we can get a little bit more of a symmetry between tension and compression. And you would find these parameters from experimental data again. So the point here is that this uh, super elastic material is very easy to use. So you need some experimental data, you can plug it in and it's available. Uh, this class of materials is available in virtually all finite element solvers, easy to use. You just use it if you're interested in these nitinol uh, super elastic materials. And uh, it's, it's really not that much that can go wrong. There's a rate independent behavior after all. So if you have any questions on any of this, you can ask them below.